Welcome back to episode 124 of Five Drinks to Midnight. In the show, we bring the questions, guests bring the drinks, we try to wrap up before midnight. Today, we're headed back into Brooklyn, going to the Travel Bar to talk to a true legend, David Wondrich, editor in chief of the Oxford Companion of Spirits and Cocktails. But before we do, like and subscribe, hit the bells, the whistles, leave a comment if you like what we're doing. Let's get started. in front of me i'm sitting at a bar talking with a friend you know that's perfect that's what, the good things in life what what else can fucking go wrong nothing yeah, so nothing. like this is awesome uh, i mean what are we drinking first well you know i was born in pittsburgh so uh we've got an old pittsburgh brand here all okay. the world excellent uh, we're drinking just their regular bar whiskey because we're in a regular bar and we should drink bar whiskey excellent I'm actually done. That's kind of an insult to Travel Bar where we are because they've got like 400 whiskeys and uh, is some of the best in the world. But yeah. it still, you know, presents as a bar. Well, and again, I'm never going to turn no. down Old Oak. No, 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 no. It is one no. of my favorites. So no. I guess I've been cheers. drinking this since the 80s. There so. you go. I mean, not just one glass. <laughs> I can nurse a drink, but well, actually, I can't. <laughs> oh, that's good. Though. Yeah, that is a again. You can never go wrong. I mean, yeah. I think, like on an older world, like you just you can't. Well, you know, they, I mean, this brand was drifting for so long, right. and uh, then they lit a fire under it. Yeah, I take a little bit of credit for that because I wrote some long detailed articles for the Daily Beast on the history of Overholt and on why Beam was screwing the pooch with it. All right. And uh, they had just been sold to Suntory. Yep. And I kind of had in the back of my mind, I knew the Suntory guys. I'd been over there in like when, when they launched uh, their Japanese whiskey and I, I knew that they would not be happy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, 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 to have it in like the press that they, that they weren't doing their best. And I thought maybe, you know, somebody might notice, and in fact they did. So uh, I've heard that from, from various people over at Overhaul, so. Yeah, I mean, like. I mean, that wasn't, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not taking claim for being responsible for the whole thing, but it helped, you yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, I take the claim for it. I, yeah. I, I, one of the hands on the lever there of the go. rock. Or, or, there was a whole bunch of people there, yeah. but. Or the boot to the ass. So yeah, yeah, well, yeah, no, yeah. it was just, you know, let's. Well, let's let's leave the butts out. Yeah, all right, all right. <laughs> no, and again, they, yeah, new releases are coming out, yeah. and it's just fucking great. Yeah. And it's nice just to see. You that. know, I've heard rumors about the distillery. I've toured the distillery, okay. or what's left of it. You know, it's this empty ruin on the on the uh, banks of the of uh, the Monongahela uh, in Connellsville, and it was the old uh, the 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 huge overhaul distillery of of, of of you know pre-prohibition days and. Up until the 70s, it was still stand, standing with a roof on it. And now there's a, there's no roofs. Uh, <laughs> the walls are you know half crumbling. All the equipment is gone. But it's still like an impressive facility. And you know someday I pray someday it'll be back with the old three chambers still thumping away. That'd be and, awesome. I mean, just like real Pennsylvania ride. That's awesome. Uh, I mean that that would be that would be the sweetest thing. Because uh, it's a real, uh, I don't know, I, I just think it's its a shame to, to, to lose that kind of Rust Belt culture, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, definitely. That part of American uh, culture and, and to yield whiskey entirely to the South. Yeah. Because it was everybody had whiskey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, well, okay. I, I think let's just jump right into question one because, again, okay. I mean, we could talk old overhaul all day, yeah, but, but no. uh, uh, question one is a little bit of an order. It's always an origin story, not a little okay. bit of an origin okay. story, but it's always an origin story. But how does a 
Shakespeare professor become like a cocktail historian and the leader of authoritarian <laughs> in cocktails. Well, I hated that job. <laughs> Not just teaching Shakespeare part, that was good. The rest of the job sucked, you know. I wasn't cut out to be uh, an English professor. Okay. I, I just, I'm not like, I'm not a real good team player. <laughs> you know, I just like to do my thing and uh, and uh, dig into stuff and and see if I can make sense out of it. And that job was just too much oversight, too okay. much, uh, too much work, uh, not enough respect. Nobody pays attention to professors anymore. Yep. And uh, you know, I, I, I'd go to like academic conferences. And they'd be held in like a in a motel on on the highway uh, outside of like some little college town yeah, yeah. where there'd be a cash bar from five to seven, <laughs> you know. And that just really wasn't the highlight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't digging it. And so I I started writing about music on the side, and uh, getting into writing about jazz of all things, but more kind of funkier early jazz. Than, than the real cerebral stuff from the, uh, you know, 60s, 70s and on. I, I was, I, I kind of like the gut bucket stuff. Okay. I mean, I like, I like the 50s stuff too. I like, I like a lot of jazz. But I, I was, I was writing about that, and I was, uh, I had a regular gig at the Village Voice for that, which was good. I was their second string uh, jazz critic, w way second string, but second <laughs> string nonetheless. <laughs> Way behind Gary Giddens, who was a genius. All right. Uh, but uh, so I was doing that, and uh, I was writing occasionally for the Sunday Times, which was great. But uh, none of that really paid anything. Okay. And uh, a friend of mine who was the uh, head of new media for Hearst Publications, which was a new job. He was just, you know, it was an old friend, Josh Mack, and he'd, he'd been a, a new media person. And uh, he calls me up one day and says, Esquire has this little project and I need somebody to do it. Do you think you'd be interested? And I said, well, you know, I like cocktails, yeah. uh, but I'm too busy. And this was like the December 1999. And uh, he goes, well, it pays. And I go, well, okay, uh, how much does it pay? And he says, $3,000. And I'm like, I will do that right now because I was a junior professor with, with a two-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's like, okay. Yeah. Three grand is looking pretty good. Yeah, it's looking yeah. real good. Uh, I can use that money. Yeah, yeah. Nobody else is just throwing <laughs> money my way. So uh, that ended up getting me uh, like a piece in Esquire magazine and a weekly column on their website. And uh, the piece in the magazine led to me taking over their drink writer job okay. and then contributing editor for years. For like six, I, I, was, I worked for Esquire for 17 years. That's, that, you know, that's, that's a, a long time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I basically started at the top of the drink writing profession and I've been working my way down ever since. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, once you're at the top, there's a I know, way I know, down, I know, right? right? I mean, there's really no better job right. than drinks, drinks person at Esquire. Yeah, yeah. People really paid attention to that. So that was a, that was a great job. And then, it, it was cocktails just a hobby then? Or like yeah, the, the, barely even a okay. hobby. I mean, it was something I always liked. I always drank cocktails. Yeah, yeah. But I also drank a lot of beer and, uh, and uh, you know, I had my spirits likes and, and, and dislikes. But uh, what really got me over on this was, it wasn't the, the drinking part, it was the fact that I had basic research skills. And this is the time that, like, the internet was digitizing all kinds of stuff. Yeah. You had access to things that you never had access to before. So I could actually research the history of these drinks and find sources. You know, that was before they were all buried in newspapers that you had to look at in microfilm. Right. Yeah. Now they're starting to digitize these things. And you could, search, you could put search terms in. Because the, the microfilm, you're, you're almost doing that in real time. Like you can go through four issues in a day, you know, in detail looking for the kind of things that drink information sure. appears in. Which is on, it's not on headlines on page one. Right, right, it's way back, yeah. Yeah, it's a little, like, half-inch item yeah. on the bottom of page 17. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you gotta really, really yeah. search through that. So uh, that was, that. you know, I, I happened to be uh, there at the exact right time. Okay. I mean, the timing was unbelievable. That was exactly when people were getting curious about this stuff and exactly when sources were, were becoming available. So I was able to, like, you know, Put the one with the other. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, my favorite, uh, you, you recently were at uh, the Sunken Harbor Club doing yeah. uh, Sunken Sundays. And uh, you, my favorite quote from that was, to be a drinks writer, you have to go out and drink. And I yeah. thought that was the best part. Like, well, you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, that's not what you're getting paid for. Yeah. You're getting paid for the writer part. Yeah. So you got to remember that. Yeah. You know, it's like I'm not getting paid to just drink. Yeah. You got. You got it. You got. But you. But you, you do got to go out and drink. drink. <laughs> and you know, I mean, for for ten years at Esquire, my last ten years there, I did uh, Esquire's best bars. Okay. And I was like the head writer on that, and sort of the the the. The I'm, my editor Ross and I cooked the thing up together and figured out you know what we was going to be in it and all that kind of stuff along with a lot of input from uh, the other editors including David Granger our fantastic editor in chief and uh, but but generally it was me and Ross okay and uh, I got to like go on one day bar crawls in various cities you know it's like we haven't really got anything from milwaukee there you go. this year you get to go there uh, hearst magazines was very cheap okay. i got one city a year nice. you know? <laughs> and the rest was i was traveling a lot for uh, other stuff so I, I managed to round up bars well as a kid from milwaukee i'm sorry you went to milwaukee so <laughs> oh, i loved it are you kidding oh my uh, god maters okay. there's some amazing bars there uh, one of my, I mean, some of my favorite bars ever are in Milwaukee. Okay. Uh, sadly, Kaz's Mini Bowl, I think, closed, yeah. which was an oh, unbelievable bar. I mean, this is Kaz's Mini Bowl. You know, my, my policy in this, uh, in these one-man bar crawls is I'd hit the ground running and I'd just go to as many bars as I could before I fell over. <laughs> and I'd have one drink in each. I go into Kaz's, it's afternoon, it's my first stop, and the first thing they ask me is, you know, I ask for a beer and, uh, and a shot, so I'm really having two drinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, they say, uh, with a beer, do you want a mini pitcher? How much is in a mini pitcher? 22 ounces. <laughs> it's like a pint, yep. but it's two ounces <laughs> more. <yeah. laughs> that was crazy it's to begin with. Then there's a jukebox, and then there's the back room was a, was a, I think it was a nine lane, half length bowling alley. And, and within five minutes there, they're asking me, you know, they come, a couple people come and talk to me a little, and how are you doing and stuff. They see I'm okay, and they say, you want to join the league? <laughs> I'm like, this is a town I like. Yeah, there you know? go. <laughs> and then uh, my next stop after that was Brian's Cocktail Lounge, where it's pitch black in there. They're playing Georgie Fame, like 1960s British organ kind of jazz R&B yep. uh, on a $25,000 Macintosh tube <laughs> system. It was $25,000 when it was installed sure. in 1972. I mean, that thing is worth a mint and the best sounding music you've ever heard in a bar in pitch blackness. And I'm drinking like uh, Mil Milwaukee style old fashioned. Nice. And, and, and I'm, I'm talking to the owner when I can see him. <laughs> I knew it was time to leave when my eyes finally adjusted. <laughs> when you can see by the yeah, dark, you're yeah, like, oh, okay, I know. Okay, yeah, this is enough. <laughs> time to go. Yeah, I mean, that was like that. You know, okay. that, that, was, that was a great job. And I went to all these cities and. Uh, for for it and and uh, you we put out our, our list every year and all the local newspaper the local uh, alternative uh, magazines or or you know like Milwaukee Magazine or something would always have a little bit on uh, like what Esquire says the best bars and why the people who are writing that are assholes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Like we put a bar in in Minneapolis, one of my favorite bars in the world, Palmer's. Palmer's is a pretty um, divey bar. Okay. I mean, very divey bar, but uh, great and has been like a, a place where cool people hang out for a hundred plus years. It was always a little on the rough side, but, <laughs> but you know, basically sound. And uh, I put it in there and half the people are like, that place, you'll get murdered there. This is the stupidest thing Escort Magazine has ever done. The other half were like, thank God, somebody finally put a good bar in, in print. You there know? you go. It's like, okay, that's what you want. All right. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, and again, I guess then how, like, again, you have multiple, we have two of your books here. Yeah, yeah. But uh, then what just kind of, 
you weren't, you know, satisfied writing, for, you know, for well, journalism anymore. Just like yeah, yeah. The author. journalism didn't didn't pay very no, much. Okay. It was great, and I and it helped me to uh, put together other streams of revenue. Let's say. Okay. But on its own, it wasn't paying very much. And also, you know, I had all this research, uh, like sort of lying around, and uh, I, I helped. Uh, put together a tribute to Jerry Thomas in uh, 2003. Jerry Thomas was, you know, the kind of the first, uh, the guy who wrote the first uh, American Bartender's Guide, okay. you know, and uh, and was it a, one of the most, uh, one of the two most famous bartenders of the 19th century and a real, you know, a, a real pioneer, I mean, a true pioneer. And I'm like, we managed. I managed to co collaborate with the people from Slow Food New York to do a tribute to him at the Plaza in 2003 because he never really got one when he died. Uh, he died poor and, and kind of forgotten. Uh, so uh, we we threw this tri this tribute and as part of it we drew up a little booklet and I wrote a little biography of him for the booklet and I'm thinking you know I should just do this as a book and with a commentary on his drinks. You know I'm coming from kind of Okay. The academic world where old, hard to understand books get commentaries. Right, right. You know that tells you how to read them and what well, explains all the weird stuff. And you know his his book, the Jerry Thomas book, is full of weird stuff. Okay. And it's hard to figure out how how the drinks tasted and what the ingredients were and the bar gear and all that stuff because he doesn't talk about yeah. any of that. Yeah. So I'm like, let me add all that stuff. And I wrote up a book proposal and talked to people I knew in the publishing industry, and they all basically laughed at me. They were like, nah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's kind of a cute idea, but nobody will ever buy that. Okay. And we're not going to give you any money for it or publish it. And, uh, you know, you should, you should just, uh, don't quit your day job. <laughs> and, and I got that like from several publishers until finally one went out on a limb and, uh, published this thing. And, Lo and behold, it won a James Beard Award. Well, I was gonna say, yeah, you fucking showed them, didn't you? You, yeah. went, you were the first person to, to, on a, to win a James Beard on cocktails, right? Yeah, the, book, yeah, the yeah. first cocktail book ever to do yeah. that. Yeah, because uh, the cocktail books had never really been taken that seriously, and so you know, I tried to make it uh, a, not a dry book, but certainly a serious book at the same time. Okay, you know, with with uh, some humor in it, at least at least a little bit. And uh, so that was that was kind of a mind blow. Okay. And uh, that that book really worked, and Bob worked great as a calling card, yeah. and, and got got me other gigs, and uh, so then I kept writing them okay. <laughs> until I got roped into doing the uh, Oxford Companion, yeah. which is a, a tombstone of a book. Yeah, that's a. Uh, I think it took nine years, and uh, you know I wrote about. Uh, 20% of it outright and rewrote many, many of the of the entries, not because they were, uh, usually not because they were wrong or bad, but because they needed to fit in with other entries. Gotcha. You know, everything had to kind of lock together. All right. So, so it wasn't all duplication or conflicting stories about this and that. You know, you wanted the book to be useful. Okay. So it needed a fairly heavy editorial hand. So that took a long time. Oh wow, nine years! Wow. Yeah, with uh, with uh, no. After two years, I got Noah Rothbaum, who had been an editor of mine, and uh, you know, and 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 still was at the time, uh, for various things. And uh, I really needed somebody who uh, really knew the industry, which he did, and knew all the drink writers, and uh, and uh, was intelligent and. Uh, and uh, and hardworking that I could split some of the work with and bounce ideas off of, et cetera, et cetera. So I couldn't have done it without him. But it was still uh, it was it still took nine years. Wow. Yeah, nice. I mean I didn't work on it full time. No, but still, like I worked on it almost full time during COVID. Okay. Because uh, you know there was nothing else to do. Right, right. <laughs> I wasn't traveling anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, none of us were going anywhere, but yeah. No, nope, uh, I, uh, I was sitting there chained to the computer in my yep. bunny slippers. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. I think that is a fucking awesome origin story. Just, you know, hobby turned professional. That's yeah. living the dream. So, uh, cheers to you on that one. Cheers. Hey, cheers, Tim.
Drink two. Question two. What are we drinking? We're drinking a Saratoga cocktail. Okay. You know, we were talking about Jerry Thomas, and I thought I'd make a drink that's associated with him. It comes from the uh, posthumous edition of his Bartender's Guide. So I have no idea who edited that okay. or, uh, you know, what Jerry Thomas had to do with this actual drink. But it does say Jerry Thomas's Bartender Guide on the cover. Okay. So good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's... Uh, Saratoga, you know, named after the resort upstate New York, uh, where all the gambling houses were. And this is a pretty sporty cocktail. It's uh, uh, a Manhattan, except you replace half the whiskey with cognac. Okay. Because why wouldn't you? Who? Right? Yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. And it just gives it a kind of a soft richness. Okay. Yeah. And we used the fantastic Jimmy Red uh, Sweet Mash uh, bourbon from... Uh, High Wire in Charleston from our friends down there. Nice. And uh, it's a lovely whiskey. Uh, we used a nice hearty cognac uh, and uh, some vermouth and some bitters and uh, done. Done. Awesome. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. This is when uh, day drinking starts to get you into trouble. Yeah, there we go. That's, that is definitely... <laughs> that I know from experience. <laughs> When you, when you start in on the on the pleasant, smooth cocktails, yeah. you know, because you have one of these, yep, yep. and you go, hey, you know, that wasn't so bad. I'm going to have another one. There you go. Because you can't one. fly on one wing. Exactly. Yeah. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta, what if I tweak it here? Yeah, you got to get there. Yeah. You got to keep it balanced. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. You can't yeah. have just one. Yep. No, yep. Yep. No, 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 no. You, you, you need you need to make sure that you're properly airborne, <laughs> which it. means means you end up chairborne. As they say. <laughs> exactly, because uh, oh. you're not going to get up. That's what, that's what club chairs were invented for. There you go. Yeah, you don't have to get up. You, you don't have to get up. You can. Yeah, just, they'll, they'll wake you up at ten o'clock. Yeah, and yeah. And send you up to your room. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, boy. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, this is definitely dangerous. That is a, That is just. Oh, it's so just that that is a easy to drink. drink. Yeah. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Do you want to go do karate in the garage? Yep. Yeah. Easy to drink. Easy, easy, easy. I mean, that was the thing about the Manhattan when it was invented. The the idea of uh, splitting a portion of the booze. Uh, 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 splitting the cocktail. The cocktail before that was all booze with just a little bitters and sugar. And they said, well, what if we replace half or a third? It was usually half back then. Half of the uh, of the booze with vermouth, which is less than half the, the strength, right? And it will really lighten up the alcohol. And it does, but it makes these things so easy to drink. Yeah. That's the problem. I know, I keep going back. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's just... yeah just pleasant, right? Mm. Where, where could there be any any harm in that? Yeah, yeah. never, like this. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so yeah. Fuck yeah, I think uh, Saratogas are gonna become like the, the new uh, daytime drink. Yeah, uh, oh, Saratoga is, I mean, it's hot rails to hell. But, you, know, <laughs> you might as well go. <laughs> might as well. Pack, pack a grip, as they used to say. There we go. All right, so question two. Yeah. We talked a little bit about it in the, in the beginning of, you know, you get one trip a year to go to a city. Yeah. You have to go out to drink to become a writer. Yeah, yeah. When, to you, what makes a good bar? Oh, boy. I mean, there's so many different kinds, yeah. you know. I think I, I'll go, I'll agree with Dale DeGroff, you know, my, my hero, my mentor, my really good friend and just uh, all around uh, wise and wonderful human being who I've been to more bars with than just about anybody I know. And, and Dale always says a sense of place. Okay. You know, the, a good bar is a bar that you, you, you know you're there. Okay. You're not anywhere else, you know. You, if, if they dropped you in there, you'd open your eyes and go, oh yeah, I'm a travel bar. Okay. You know, or I'm at uh, McSorley's. Uh, uh, I'm at whatever. And a lot of modern bars tend to be a little more cookie cutter. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't really get the sense. They don't, they, their decor is done by consultants, yeah. not by, uh, the best bars, I always think the decor is done by the customers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they put stuff up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, McSorley's, the decor is done by the customers. They brought in pictures and said, put this up. Put this up. Yeah. 
Yeah, hey, yeah, you know, it'd be like, hey, John, yeah, there's, you know, it's the baseball team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, and that's, I, again, that's what, why I love, like, Travel Bar, because we have everything from actual, the travel cases, to bottles killed, to Star Wars pop-up books, yeah. to unicorn yeah, meat. Yeah, like, yeah, there's exactly. so much stuff here, and it, it fun tells weird you games, that, and, like, everything. And, you know, like, it tells you that people live here. Yeah. You know, and that's the, that's the best thing for any bar, is to have, you know, that people live there. I mean, there some really fancy bars still have a great sense of place. Camparino in uh, in in Milan is the uh, right on the main square across from the cathedral. It was opened by Campari, you know, <laughs> almost a century ago, and uh, that has this massive cast metal S-shaped bar. Uh, the the bar top is this unbelievable piece of casting, right? That tells you, okay, Italy's feeling it's industrial oats. Okay. You know, it's like 1900 and now we've got heavy industry. Let's do this. Let's just cast the whole bar top. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's got like uh, mosaic walls of uh, tropical birds <laughs> and bright. And uh, so it, it, it's like got this glorious decor. And yet, you know, there'd be street sweepers from the square outside popping in for a coffee or maybe a little shot of Amaro next to people in tuxes when you're there. It's 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 like, okay, that is this place, you know, no place else. Mm. And there, there's a lot of stuff like that, yeah. you know. It's like places that just, you get the sense that they mean something to people and, uh, and uh, that they are uh, inhabited, okay. you know. And, and for me, that's... That's what makes a great bar. That. All right. Well, there we go. That's question two. So All right, there great. we go. We fix that one. So yep. Cheers. Cheers. All right. All right. Question three. Drink three. All right. What are we drinking? Well, we're drinking lager here. All right. Perfect. Because uh, after a couple spiritist drinks, if I can. I like to I like to ratchet things back a there little. There we go. Little that play out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it's maintenance. Yeah. And I was, I really enjoy beer. Okay. And uh, you know, a nice beer is a nice beer. Cheers. Cheers. Oh god. Mm. There's nothing like the first sip of beer. Right. If it could only be first sips, you know, <laughs> where it just just goes down. down. And every nerve in your body goes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, finally, hydration. You're finally thinking of us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> You're the best. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous, but it's, but it's kind of true. You yeah. just get that, that feeling, you know. Uh, there's nothing like it. Uh, that's awesome. All right, so question three. Yeah. Uh, since we, like you said, we're now three drinks in, you know, doing yeah, yeah. a little day drinking. I'm not even close to midnight yet, no, but uh, we we'll, usually, we'll get there. We'll get there, yeah, yeah. Uh, travel bar has usually been my record of late episodes, so it, <laughs> it, it, it has uh, known to go a yeah, little yeah. longer at travel yeah, bar. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's Mike. I, I just, I don't know. Uh, I, I would say it's probably Mike. It's probably Mike. Uh, and the whiskey. All right, so question three. Uh, we usually call this our talking shit segment because we've okay. had three drinks. Okay. Uh, and again, being the historian yourself, so what's one trend or one thing that you wish would come back? And what's one thing happening in the bar industry right now that you wish would die? Okay, let me think about that. Um, Don't want to get you in trouble. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the... Uh, all my bartender friends are going to hate me, <laughs> but I wish creativity would die. Okay. <laughs> Not die. I, I just, I, I just wish it would get like a debilitating disease, and uh, you know, have to rest a lot. Okay. Because uh, you know, you look back uh, on the history of, of, of cocktails in America and bars, and uh, I collect old cocktail menus, yeah. and from like 1910 up into the 1960s, they were basically the same. It was the same drinks every every house would invent like two or three drinks there were a couple of people who were real inventive okay. but they were so much of a of a of, of a, an exception like don the beachcomber right. was real inventive but then everybody copied him yeah you know so he became 
for a different kind of bar, it became just the same thing. They all did his drinks, yeah. the same drinks. So that meant when you went to a bar, it wasn't like, let me read the list and uh, decide and taste this and see if it's going to be okay. You just got a drink and then you talked about other stuff. You didn't spend so much attention on the drink. You know, it was more the attention was on the people you were with. And I, I kind of like that. Okay. I, I, I'm a little tired of creativity and drinks. Okay. And, and uh, so many bars I know, invent, they've got a great drink on their menu. The next time I go in there, it's gone. And I've, you know, I've, I've taken the trouble to wade through this long menu and go, yeah, that's, that sounds good. I don't know, I don't really like that. Uh, that one's good. Uh, that's not what I'm in the mood for, maybe another time. Oh, there we go, there's my drink. Yeah. And that takes a while, yeah, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and gives you a little bit of anxiety. Uh, and then uh, you, you, you go back next time thinking, yeah, they got that drink that I liked. No, they don't. No, no, gone. <laughs> gone. So uh, that that's something I kind of like to see. Uh, like I said, not die, but cut back okay. considerably. Okay. I'd like I'd like to see like some agreement on cocktail lists, and we've all got you know mostly or largely the same stuff. It's, it doesn't mean you don't do your version of it. Your little tweaks around the edges. Sure. sure. But it's tweaks around the edges. It's not like wholesale substitutions, yep. you know? It's like an extra dash of this or that, or or maybe it's the brands you use. It's not like, well, we we changed, we fat washed everything yeah, yeah. And, and, and did all this stuff. Well, I think you kind of nailed it in question two, where you were like, I yeah. don't even order off your damn menu. Yeah. I can put for that, just yeah. give me my martini and I'll be fine. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. eventually you get to the point that, I, that I can, I, I'm at the point where I have to be an asshole about yeah. it. <laughs> And I feel bad, but you know, I've got to do it. But uh, just for my own sanity. But uh, so th there's that. Uh, I just, you know, I've had like fantastic new drinks, but everybody invents so many of them. Yeah. It's like, you know, gear it back a little. Like, put like four new drinks on your menu, and then, you know, choose some classics and some other no drinks that are. You know, like classics that are old and and good, yep. and uh, you know, really get to the bottom of what made them good. Uh, I like that idea of depth of drilling down, of practicing this drink, of making it over and over and over until it just flows out of you. You know, that's that's very nice. Nice, like a daiquiri. Everybody can make a great daiquiri these days. Yep, almost everybody. Almost everybody. <laughs> say, it's... There are exceptions. Yeah, yeah sadly, uh, but. Uh, so then, what, what do I wish would come back? Uh, well, I wish peach brandy would come back. Okay. And I've been trying and talking with people. Uh, High Wire is, is, is doing a good one. Ann and Scott Marshall down there in, in, uh, in Charleston. Uh, Catoctin Creek does one in okay. Virginia. There are a couple other people. Uh, Copper and, and Kings. Copper and Kings. Does a peach brandy? That's right. Uh, there, there are a few others that I've, you know, some I've talked to. Kuchan in California, back in the day. Uh, there are a few. There's a Peach Street in uh, in Colorado, but nobody's really broken through with it and made it like a, a standard thing that you can easily get. Okay. It's always special releases. And peach brandy was the most expensive spirit, uh, domestic spirit in America. Uh, from well before the revolution until, you know, the 1880s, something like that. That was our luxury product. Okay. And, you know, it was made from peaches. It's not the, the, the liqueur, the, the muck that's like flavored, it's like cheap California brandy flavored with, with peaches Peach. and sugar. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not that. It's like distilled from peaches, which are a bitch to work with. you got to get them when they're ripe. Mashing them is disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you got to crack the kernels. They always had the kernels cracked. Yeah. You know, not always, but that was the the considered the good way to make it. So uh, you got to be a little careful of cyanide. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, yep. Yeah. But but you know it, it it doesn't carry through the still if if you're a good distiller. Um, so uh, and and then it would be aged and used barrels. Uh, you know for a good. So sometimes up to six, 12 years. 
but uh, the six year stuff was considered to be nectar. Okay. Uh, I've had four year, which is great, and uh, a lot of good two year stuff. And most of it is good, and especially in mixed drinks, it's fabulous. All right. But this was the American cognac, you know, and uh, at its best, it was like, okay, that is, you know, that that's phenomenally good stuff because it doesn't have a heavy peach flavor. Okay. It just tastes like good brandy. Okay. You know, it's got that that great kind of brandy richness with a little peachy, like aftertaste. Okay. Because it's you know it's distilled. Uh, it's it's been fermented heavily and uh, and uh, you've got the pits in there to give it some nuttiness and uh, it's sat in wooden barrels. Okay. So it's fantastic. I really wish we could get that like at any good liquor store for a reasonable. There price. we go. I love and it. I could go and pick up like you could pick up a bottle of Laird's Bonded. I could go and pick up a bottle of uh, High Wire Bonded Peach Brandy and like there goes my Fish House Punch. You know. Mm. It's, it's a, it was an essential uh, ingredient in Fish House Punch. Okay. And uh, when you make it with peach brandy, you can see why. Okay. It's just so fucking good. <laughs> uh, we read an article uh, where, because I, I thought you would have gone with uh, uh, serving your cocktails that are supposed to be up over ice. Oh, yeah, I don't like that. Yeah, you hate, so you hate yeah, that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, why, yeah. why do you hate serving up cocktails over ice? Well, uh, I got to preface this that, you know, this is for me. Right. I, I don't care what you do. Right, right. But uh, I don't like it because I drink cocktails really fast. Okay. And uh, I don't need the ice in there. <laughs> and the ice makes it look ugly. And I like the texture of an up cocktail. Okay. You know, where it's just silky smooth and you just take these few icy sips. In my case, like two. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Uh, a little more than that. Yeah. But, but you know, I don't, I don't linger over a cocktail. Okay. And uh, and you just, you sip it, and it's just so good. All right. And uh, the ice, it kind of thins out the drink, it bumps on your teeth, and you know, <laughs> it gets in the way. And then uh, people take a New York sour. One of my uh, favorite drinks ever is a, a whiskey sour. Originally, it was up, and then you float red wine on top, yeah. right? And that gives it this fantastic uh, layer of kind of thin, slightly, you know, woody, uh, acidic red wine and then the rich whiskey sour underneath. And uh, it, you can't beat it. But uh, first people put egg white in it, yeah. which when you float the red wine on top is ugly as hell. It looks like a purple bruise. <laughs> and uh, in, instead of this, if you do, if you do the, 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 the original version right, you just get this crisp layer floating on top of, yeah. the, of the drink, and it's beautiful. You know, every time you order one, and everybody else at the bar goes, hey, I want one of those. <laughs> that looks great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it is great. Uh, so, so people not only put egg white in it, because you're supposed to put egg white in a whiskey sour, and they can't. A lot of younger bartenders haven't, don't have the years of experience drinking cocktails. Mm -hmm. And they can't see that, you know, I need to adjust this because I'm making a change here. Yeah. You know, it's like it's got to be, I learned a sour has egg white. So therefore, this sour has to have egg white, you know. And, uh, and I can't, like, say, well, it looks weird. It doesn't matter. It's like the rule trumps the, the, the common sense. Right, right. And then they, put a, then they put, like, a big ice rock in it. Yeah. And it's like, and it doesn't look like anything anymore. And it's got ice, you know, in it messing up the texture. And it's like, it, it's it, it, it just, you've spent all this time getting this fantastic effect that you've just completely ruined. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I thought too, uh, that you, you also finished it up with, it's because I fucking collect strainers. So like, yeah, yeah. I think well, there's that too. <laughs> that was the... Yeah, that's that, okay. I was maybe horsing around a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I, do, I do have a big collection of old strainers. Uh. Right. I like to use them. And then you also have a uh, a collection of uh, replicate uh, barware. Yeah, I, I do. I have a, uh, my friend Greg Bohm and I, he owns uh, Cocktail Kingdom, which he's parlayed into like the dominant uh, high-end bar gear uh, yeah. maker. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, he and I sat down and said, 
What would we like to see? Because we both collect antique bar gear. It is an absolutely fabulous collection. I've got a smaller collection, but still a pretty good one. And uh, we said, well, this one, and this one, and this one's really beautiful, and let's do them silver plated, you know, and, uh, and do them right. Nice. So we've got a couple very expensive cocktail shakers, but they are silver plated. There you go. And uh, really are, are quite lovely. And then we've got like punch bowls because nobody makes punch bowls. Yes, yep. And the ones they make are kind of bogus looking. They're just these stupid glass things. Uh, we've got some, a couple China ones with uh, art on them and uh, that look like 18th century nice. punch bowls. Uh, punch ladles, nobody's making yeah. attractive punch yeah. ladles. You know, we've got silver and ebony uh, pun punch ladles uh, with, with like wooden, wooden handles. We've got all kinds of stuff and, uh, you know, some strainers, some old jiggers, the old style, like all calibrated now. And uh, yeah, it's fun. It's, nah, it's uh, awesome. Is there a tool that you wish you would make or would consider uh, making? I'd, I'd like to do a good ice mallet. Right. I'd like to do a good ice scoop. We're still talking about that. Okay. Like a silver plated uh, small ice scoop that will fit inside a highball glass so you can make juleps in it. Okay. Because it's hard to get the ice into a julep glass you when you're making cook, juleps. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so if you've got a small scoop, it makes it possible to, to make juleps fast. Okay. Because uh, you crush the ice and then you use the small scoop and it goes right in. Nice. And it fits right into the glass and leaves the ice behind. So that's that's very useful. Okay. Awesome. Well, there we go. I don't think we talked that much shit. I don't think anybody's feelings no. were affected. Right, so I, 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 I think we were good. We kept you uh, out of trouble. So <laughs> cheers to that. Cheers. Get out. <laughs> <laughs>
that looked like a rubber toy, <laughs> like blown up, uh, you know, in excess. The thing was probably nine inches long, uh, and and evil, black and evil looking. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's in this bottle. I don't know how they got it in there, uh, and uh, I smell and taste this stuff. Take a little tiny sip. And it tastes like bug spray. Okay. And there wasn't a mark on that centipede. <laughs> That's how they got it in there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I, 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 this thing's going to realign my DNA. Yeah, yeah. You know. So, uh, so uh, they, then they open the Cobra wine. And I, I smell it. And it smells like dead animal. Yeah. And uh, nasty. And I authoritatively say, uh, I, I would drink this, but it's spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> And I got off the hook. There you Cause, go. Because nobody else was going to drink it either. Because it probably was spoiled, spoiled. Yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. in point of fact. Yeah. Because it smelled nasty. Oh, that's yeah. nasty. And there was this whole cobra inside. So that was, you know, that was me uh, trying to, like, you know, be the uh, sang foie Esquire. I'll drink anything. Okay. Now. You know, it, it's all it's all cool. Thing now there are, there are bars that specialize in taste of like cocktails. For me, I'm not so interested in that. Fair. You know, that's me though. Again, I'm I'm su I'm like super not conservative about some things, but when it comes to drinks, I'm pretty conservative. Yeah, yeah. no, I get it. Like, because again, you just want to drink. Like, yeah, I'm I coming to drink, your bar. I'm not I drink, your wind. I, I want delicious whiskey that tastes like delicious whiskey. Whiskey, yeah, yeah. You know, not a centipede. Or, yeah, or, or, yeah. Or, I, don't, I don't need all that other stuff. Or, yeah, the, I don't need novelty. It's yeah. like, I mean. You know, that old old overall we had is a $25 bottle of whiskey. There you go. Can't go wrong. Yeah, I, I drink that all day. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I recently had a bottle of uh, uh, Heaven Hill Bonded that's yeah. a $40 bottle of whiskey. Yeah. yeah. And that's delicious. Yeah. Although I do, I do like my Johnny Walker Black Label okay. uh, quite a bit because you can get that anywhere in the world. Okay. When you're traveling abroad, that you know I travel the, abroad a fair amount, and, and that would be that. That's an important consideration. There you go. I was just in Japan, and at a convenience store in a gas station, I found 200 milliliter of Johnny Walker Black for seven dollars. There you go. Yeah. I mean, they're practically paying you to drink it. Yeah, right yeah. There. Yeah. And you know the, the whole bottle was like 23 bucks, but this was like I, we were. I was on a little bus with some people touring uh, Shochu distilleries. Yeah. And I'm let, let me uh, we had we had like a couple hour bus ride. Uh, let me just buy this and I'll split it up. Everybody gets a shot. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Two hundred milliliters it went like all at once. But for seven bucks, seven bucks, I could be a sport. Yeah, you know? but like, also that's cheaper than any bar or whatever. I know, like, you I know. Seven, like I know. Shots I know. For like, I know. Hey, yeah, you ain't getting. Yeah, when I, I mean I, that was almost that's almost like. That's almost seven ounces. Yeah. You know, that's a that's a that's a good good amount of whiskey. Yeah, there. can't go wrong. For, like, I think yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a dollar an ounce. Yeah, I was gonna say it's a dollar an ounce. Like, like really, it's like okay. That is, that is good bar back. Yeah, right and, there. you know, and that's a, that's a good whiskey. I've tasted yeah. it uh, uh, modern versions against uh, historical versions, and they're pretty much the same. Yeah, that's that's something that hasn't changed much. They they've invested a lot of money in keeping that more or less the same. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean that's you know that's grown up drinks. Yeah, well there we go. So now we know you'll drink almost anything except for uh, stuff with dead animals in it. So yeah, uh, you know, and, 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 good, and you know, stuff with bananas in it because oh, yeah. I hate bananas. Okay, so, well I think that's a good rule of thumb. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cheers. Cheers. All right. All right. Question five. Drink five. All right. Last drink, drink five. Night. What are we drinking? Well, one of my favorite whiskeys, Bushmills 10-Year-Old Malt. Can't go wrong. I know. Uh, I mean, a soft, lovely, subtle whiskey, but so sessionable. And this is the kind of thing you put a bottle out with your friends and it just sinks. Yeah. Everybody pours themselves a little more. I love spirits like that, you know, where it's just like so drinkable. Yeah, can't go wrong. Oh. Yeah, but smell this. Cheers. Cheers. Light and grainy, but not like thin, yep. you know. A little bit of forest floor there, like like good Irish whiskeys yeah. have. Yep. A little bit of muskiness. A little bit, yep. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I just love that. Yeah, the bushmill, you just can't go, like, no, again, you, you, you're, you're going through Mike's collection here, and it just, yeah, yeah. It just, but yeah, Bushmills 10, you just, again, 
at a white label. Yeah. Like, it's just yeah. one of those things. There's things like, that are underappreciated but are just, you know, they're great. And and I, I kind of look at the, the, the luxury spirits market and in general, that's not made for me. Yeah. I mean, there is a big exception is I'm a huge cognac fan and I don't like the VS cognacs. Okay. And VSOP cognacs I like for mixing. But for drinking, I like XO Cognacs. Right. Those are all expensive. Okay. They're just never cheap, and they can't be cheap in considering how they're made. Uh, so that's my problem. I think it's kind of like the most underrated spirit right now. In some kind of, ways it is. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and when you taste like a really good XO, it's like, God yeah. damn, there's no drinking in this world better than this, yeah. you know? It's balanced, it's rich, it's thick. Uh, creamy, uh, soft at the same time, but not like wimpy, mm. you know? And, and, and you just, it's just so satisfying, yeah. you know? No, it's I like, you. ah, I am living the good life yes. while I'm drinking this. Very much. It doesn't matter what else is going on. This life is good. So yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Excellent. All right, well, question five. Yeah. Comes down to flip of the Whiskey Wednesday coin. You can flip it, you can spin it, you can do whatever All you right. want. The coin gives us the answer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you bring my own coin. All right. Because I don't trust yours. You're gonna trust my coin, but you do have yours. All right. So, <laughs> you can split, all right? So. I'm not looking at it Okay, uh, question five. On a plane, if there's an emergency, and someone says, is there a doctor on the plane? Do you raise your hand? Uh, let's see what the coin says. Coin says fuck yeah. So, uh, this coin says fuck yeah. yeah. Coin's an idiot. Coin's an idiot. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I mean, if somebody says, help, I, I can't figure out the first line of Lucretius. <laughs> is there a doctor on the plane? Then I raise my hand. <laughs> you raise your hand. <laughs> you <know? laughs> <laughs> but if, if somebody's choking on something, uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna spin this until it says fuck, fuck no, no. <laughs> fuck no, fuck no. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't use I don't use like that my my the title that I'm I, I that I'm legally granted uh, very often. Yeah. Uh, I use it when people are throwing credentials around. Yep. And then okay, well I've got one too. Yeah, yeah. So you know, can we move on? Yeah. Uh, but in general, no. It's not. It's not something I, I usually use. I mean, you know, for me the whole point of graduate school, I didn't go primarily to as a career uh, sort of uh, qualification. I went because I wanted to learn shit. Right. And they were paying me. Yep. I was I was on scholarship. They paid me to read books, and I couldn't find a regular job before that. Uh, and so uh, it was late 80s and I was an English graduate. There was no internet. The internet has been, believe it or not, great for people with English degrees. There you go. Because you need a lot of writing. Yeah. You know, and uh, before that, nobody needed a lot of writing. So uh, I just went to grad school and, and realized I didn't want to do English, so I did comparative literature. And uh, I, read, I learned a bunch of languages. And, Read a, read a bunch of stuff that was very interesting. I uh, loved that part of it. And then the teaching part, I didn't like so much. Okay. I like the teaching, not the administration. All right. Uh, but as, as we've established. Yeah. I, I usually joke with people that uh, I can write you a doctor's note, but unfortunately I'm just not that kind of doctor. So yeah. therefore, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can, but yeah. All right, well, David, that's five rings down, five questions answered. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate Thank you, Tim. your this time. Has been a great pleasure, how much fun, and uh, you know, five good drinks. Yeah, I agree. So I hope we can drink together again very soon. I look so, forward to it. So cheers to you. Cheers. Thank you again. Thank you again. And thank you, Mike from Travel Bar. Thank you, Mike. <laughs>